This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics and never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. At the Infographics Show, we're endlessly fascinated by the creative ways people have found to break the law, as well as the creative ways the authorities have dealt with those lawbreakers throughout history. Past episodes have covered history's greatest thieves, as well as the laws you yourself break every day. Today we're answering a question from one of our viewers, Petros, who wants to know a how counterfeit money is made, and b how realistic it is. We'll assume he's asking for a friend, and for our Secret Service viewers, rest assured that we would never advocate any of the systems we'll be describing. As you'll see, counterfeit money is a niche crime, requiring a great deal of skill and organization to do well, and probably not even worth trying for small-time operators. So warnings noted, here's what you would do if you did, which you shouldn't. Counterfeiting has been the bane of all money-based economies, and the penalties in former times were surprisingly harsh. In 17th century Britain, for example, men caught counterfeiting were hanged, while women were burned at the stake. Yes, somehow they even managed to work sexism into that arena. The death sentence was a common penalty for counterfeiting until relatively recently. It was seen as a challenge to state authority, and on a more practical level, fake money threatened to slow down national economies by making people less likely to accept any money at all. Widespread counterfeiting also had the potential to cause rapid inflation by increasing the total money supply, although it took until the early modern era for this second principle to really sink in. Countries at war took to flooding their enemies with counterfeit cash as a way to wreck their economy, although the logistics sometimes prevented the scheme from working. In World War II, the Nazis printed up a supply of fake British pound notes, which they intended to drop from airplanes flying over Great Britain. This plan literally never got off the ground. The United States government started minting coins in 1792, but paper money was a different story. Identifying counterfeit bills among the various designs around at the same time required vigilance and apparently was really difficult, because by the Civil War a third of all paper money in the US was counterfeit, not to mention the piles of fake Confederate money the Union printed to sabotage the economy of rebel states. To deal with the scourge of counterfeit currency, Abraham Lincoln created the Secret Service. Its early incarnation only dealt with counterfeiting. Over the course of the late 19th century, a series of reforms centralized the issuing of paper currency under the supervision of the Treasury Department, and by 1877 the Bureau of Printing and Engraving was actually manufacturing all the country's greenbacks. Completely standardized currency followed in the 20th century. Federal Reserve notes, still the class of currency in use today, issued by the central bank since 1913, began to replace earlier notes issued directly by the Treasury. Uniformity made counterfeit bills harder to pass than in the early days of the Republic, but some crafty criminals were up to the challenge. The technique of replicating the fine lines of the dollar denominations required a similar attention to detail as the creation of fake works of art. The distribution of counterfeits became, like extortion and smuggling, a specialty of America's crime syndicates. The Secret Service continued to investigate and shut down these domestic operations, although never decisively. And then came the super notes. Super notes, also called super dollars, started showing up at the end of the 1980s. Unlike garden variety fakes, which an expert could usually identify without difficulty, a super note was virtually identical to a real hundred or fifty. Law enforcement could only speculate who was turning out the high end knockoffs, but they believed the culprit had to be a hostile government to pull off the quality of workmanship. Real US money is printed on proprietary paper stock, a blend of linen and cotton, with tiny red and blue threads scattered into the mix. And the private crane currency company is the exclusive supplier, with the federal government its exclusive buyer. Genuine dollars also require intaglio printing, a multi-stage process that creates a distinct texture. Whoever was making the super notes had access to equipment functionally identical to the US government. Suspects initially included East Germany and Iran, although conventional wisdom settled upon North Korea. Speculation even pointed to the CIA as the underground operation. The source remains unknown. 
with a new level of technique threatening to make serious dents in public confidence, or perhaps even the stability of the dollar, the Treasury Department, Federal Reserve, and Secret Service worked on the first major paper note redesign in decades, with a new version of the 100 released in 1996. The new security features included a watermark and the now familiar security strip, which glows pink under a blacklight, microprinting beyond the scope of most consumer digital processes, ink that changes color when viewed at different angles, and a hologram. As new versions of other denominations followed, a common tactic was to continue to mimic the old designs, which were still legal tender. And despite the formidable obstacles thrown up by the new hundreds, fifties, and twenties, almost immediately counterfeiters began to reverse engineer the details. It's perhaps unsurprising that next generation supernotes hit the market, given the resources available to their printer, whoever it was. But street level printing was also quick to catch up, with the notorious Art Williams Jr. setting the standard. As journalist Jason Kirsten details in his 2010 book The Art of Making Money, Williams began his counterfeiting career in 1987 at the age of 15, learning the art of hand printing money from a mentor called Da Vinci. Over the course of the 1990s, he refined his own method, which combined traditional printing techniques with the digital manipulation with Photoshop, a pirated copy of course. He had a stable of underworld clients for his wares, selling his prints for 20 cents on the dollar. Following his release from his second brief prison stint in 1996, his girlfriend Natalie showed him one of the new $100 bills. He thought he could crack it and got to work. In addition to the layers of artwork and coloration required to match the design, he wanted a paper that could stand up to the iodine pen test, which turns black when applied to most wood-based papers. Trial and error led him to develop a product with two layers of newsprint glued together, which also allowed the insertion of a fairly realistic security strip. Impressing his old buyers, he now had a market with fewer competitors and could up his asking price. Art and Natalie also turned the operation into a romantic adventure that played like an Oscar contender. The couple headed out on a cross-country crime spree, lighting up a constant of shopping malls along the route to Oregon. In each town, they'd case not just the mall but also the town center to get an idea how fast the cops could show up. For each job, they took a set path in and out of the mall, using one of the department store anchor chains, which they would skip as their entrance. Then Natalie would make her way from store to store with Art carrying the packages and resupplying Natalie with fake hundreds. Now, they were making substantially more than 20% on each bill as they pocketed the change from each purchase, adding to the full hero charm of the couple, they began purchasing items specifically for charitable donations at churches and the Salvation Army drop centers. It was back in Chicago, though, that the cops caught up with him, discovering the counterfeit money while busting him for marijuana possession in a hotel room. Part of what made the road trip so successful was the duo's understanding that they couldn't hit the same store or even the same mall twice in a row. Small towns also proved less likely to question the bill's authenticity than, for instance, people in Los Angeles. The bill would pass the iodine test, but they weren't foolproof. Meanwhile, in the late 90s and early 2000s, another tier of counterfeiter emerged on the scene. In a trend analogous to music file sharing, enterprising teens and 20-somethings started realizing the potential of high DPI inkjet printers. Many of these two-bit forgers never successfully passed a single bill, with law enforcement sometimes seeming more embarrassed for them than anything. Some kids were pragmatic, printing low-denomination bills for routine purchases. In many cases, they were using regular printer paper which feels totally wrong, smooth instead of textured, and a magnifying glass could reveal the blurred details. Others were more ambitious, bleaching the color off of singles or fives and reprinting them as $100 or $50 bills. By 2004, 40% of the counterfeit currency in the US originated in these small-scale DIY setups. The real action, though, was happening in South America. Colombia, for a time, dominated the professional counterfeiting market, developing a distribution network along the lines of the drug cartels that once held a grip on that country. But Peru proved to be the lasting home of the industry. Labor costs in Peru are especially low, and even though the US Secret Service now has its own office in the country's capital of Lima, enforcement remains a challenge. Dealing with fake currency is a fact of daily life in the capital, and cashiers keep a hole punch by the register, ready to destroy any bills their customers try to pass. 
The manufacturing process uses high-end offset printing equipment, which involves the automated etching of metal plates based on finessed photos. Venezuelan currency, which has suffered severe inflation, now serves as a source of paper stock. Ten or more craftspeople each perform a step in the assembly and refinement, such as sewing a security strip into the note or simulating the texture of an embossed stamp. The work is spread out over multiple locations, with the artisans kept in the dark about their colleagues' whereabouts. In Lima, multiple buyers package the bills in hiding places such as stuffed animals or suitcase linings, and travelers known as barriers fly with the goods to various distribution points around the world. It enters the US via Mexico, where the barriers hand them off to coyotes or traffickers, who in turn smuggle the bills into the states. Hardening the Mexican border might put a squeeze on that supply network, but don't bank on it. Counterfeiting is proving more lucrative than cocaine, and most of the fake dollars are destined for the international market rather than the United States. Meanwhile, euros remain a potential growth market despite the EU's recent instability. Counterfeiting American currency remains very rare. 99.99% of all US currency in circulation is genuine. There's a natural bottleneck. At some point, the bills have to hit the street, and that requires personal transactions. Whether the product of a dorm room operation or an international cartel, the notes have to pass into the marketplace. If they don't make it past one transaction, they're very likely to get stopped and confiscated when the retailer attempts to make a bank deposit. Banks send money through scanners to read the magnetic signature of the ink. Even the best Peruvian reproductions fail that test. There's no compensation by the bank or the feds since, for all they know, you're trying to run the scam yourself. It's a frustrating moment for you if you're the consumer who's out a hundred bucks, but the bill is out of circulation. The economy as a whole doesn't suffer too much, although there is some loss of confidence. You've probably noticed signs at a mom and pop shop indicating that they won't take anything bigger than a 20. Or maybe you haven't because you pretty much don't use cash anyway. After a centuries long arms race between states and scoundrels, the ultimate demise of fake money could come with the decline of real money. Fraud, though, is here to stay. Identity theft and counterfeit goods are much bigger business than the quaint art of printing your own money. And the decline of cash and the transition to digital cash only means that cyber threats are more dangerous than ever and getting worse all the time. Even just having one of your online accounts or credit cards hacked can seriously harm your life and the financial impact can be devastating. Luckily for you, Dashlane has your back. Dashlane auto-generates and stores super strong, unique passwords for your different online accounts, so signing in is as easy as just clicking a single button. Plus, Dashlane will work on any platform, so you're always able to log in with ease, and you're always secure. Their constant monitoring of your information will immediately alert you to any hacks or breaches on sites you have accounts for, and their ultralight VPN will encrypt your online activity with just the push of a button. Head on over to dashlane.com slash infographics for a free 30-day trial, and if you use the coupon code infographics, you can get 10% off a premium subscription today. Do you even use cash anymore? What's the last thing you actually had to open up your wallet to buy when they annoyingly wouldn't accept Apple Pay? Tell us in the comments, then go watch our other video, The Fastest Way People Turned $1 Into $1 Million. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.